What is up, everybody? This is Dan Rock Zero Eight, and now we are going to start a brand new year in review series with 1998. 1997 was such a great year. So many, so many changes has happened in that year alone. Raw going from all these sirens and you know the classic raw style. Now it has this adult contemporary industrial vibe to it. They have this big ass Titantron. It's Raw is War. It's two hours. You had, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin gaining so much momentum. He becomes such a phenomenal superstar. Such a great superstar. He gained so much momentum in 1997 alone. They could have made him WWF champion if they really wanted to. And it really wouldn't make of a difference. No smart, mark, stupid asshole fan back in 1997 would have said, oh, Stone Cold Steve Austin's not ready to be the WWF champion yet. You know, no one would have fucking said that. Rocky Maivia turns into The Rock is a part of the nation and domination and they move on and on and they build on to that into 1998. Triple H is no longer Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Now he's fucking Triple H, this fucking degenerate with Shawn Michaels, who is no longer the boyhood dream. Now, now it's not about the showstopper. Now he's the degenerate. You have Guys like Mankind, who used to be this tortured soul. Now he is so sympathetic. Then they added on to Mick Foley. They added in Dude Love and the Cactus Jack. And Mankind, Dude Love and the Cactus Jack. They added all sorts of stuff. WCW. They had Sting go the entire year without even saying a fucking word. And he is one of the biggest stars. Can you name a superstar that can have all the momentum in the world as Sting did in 1997 without saying a fucking word whatsoever? I don't think you can. They have this debut of Goldberg, and we all know how big of a star Goldberg becomes in 1998. Hollywood Hogan becomes an even bigger star. And yes, they did kind of fuck up with Starcade, but at this point in time, WCW could do no wrong. ECW got its very first pay-per-view, and now they're just building and building and building so much more momentum, and they become even bigger of a company. So 1997 was just such a phenomenal year. It's one of the greatest years of all time, quite frankly. And 1998 builds everything from 1997 and more so. 1998 is such an incredible year, and Stone Cold Steve Austin becomes such a superstar in 1998. He literally could have retired at the end of 1998, retired, and become one of the greatest superstars of all time. Even at this point in 1998, he would have been considered one of the greatest of all time. And no one's going to argue that, I think. The Rock becomes an even bigger star. Triple H gets to be on his own, the leader of DX. There's so much shit that goes on in 1998. 1998 is such a spectacular year. It's one of the greatest years of all time. So let's start off with the Warrior Rumble. This is such a good show. Vader defeats the artist formerly known as Goldust. The only bad thing of 1998 WWF. Well, that and Road Warrior Hawk shit. This is a good match. Vader gets the Vader bomb on Goldust with Luna on his back. This is a good match. 6.5 out of 10. Goldust doesn't look too bad here. He didn't look as shitty as he did on the Christmas Raw where he was dressed up as a fucking uh, Christmas tree. Um, he doesn't look too bad here. He does wear this really ugly green and purple unitard with blue hair, but it doesn't look too bad. 6.5. Next up, we have a Midget Division match with uh, Sonny as the special guest referee. Max Mini, Mosaic, Nova, and they defeat Battleon. El Torito, not that El Torito, and Tarantula in a fun, good match. Uh, 5.5 out of 10. This is actually a fun match. Very well paced. I liked it. Um, I would say this and WLC, as far as 
midget matches go are these are some of the finest midget division matches there is. Those two matches are one of the finest, one of the most underrated uh, rivalries in the Attitude Era, in my opinion, was The Rock and Ken Shamrock. And on this show, they had one of their finer matches. The Rock defeats Ken Shamrock via disqualification to retain his Intercontinental title. Um, Ken Shamrock was fucking awesome. In my opinion, I don't care what anybody says about Billy Gunn, because he isn't. But I would say Ken Shamrock was one of the most, is the most underrated superstar of the Attitude Era, in my opinion. Hell, I, I think if Ken Shamrock wasn't in this pool of sharks with Stone Cold and The Rock and then Triple H and Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. I feel like if Ken Shamrock was in his prime in 2003, I think Ken Shamrock could have been one of the biggest stars of all time, honestly. Ken Shamrock was fucking awesome. And I think maybe if he was in his prime around in the early 2000s, maybe he could have been a much bigger superstar. But this is a fine match. A 6 out of 10. I liked it a lot. Ken Shamrock had this belly to belly. He gets the pinfall. It looks like he's going to win. But The Rock earlier on snuck a pair of brass knucks down his trunks. So the referee pulls out the brass knucks and disqualifies Ken Shamrock. And once again, Ken Shamrock gets screwed out of the title. And wouldn't you know it? This underrated rivalry gets, even in the Attitude Era, they were doing the dusty finish. Ha ha ha. The dusty finish. Ha <laughs> ha. Ain't nobody wins and ain't nobody loses, daddy. Hot times. Hot times is when you work in a steel mill for 30 years. 30 years and they kick you in the butt and they give you a watch. And they say, a machine took your job. That's hard times. Well, hard times also, nobody wins, nobody loses. King Shamrock doesn't win the Intercontinental title, Daddy. No, no. He had a pair of brass dunks in his trunks. Good match. 6 out of 10. The, the uh, New Age Outlaws retain their tag team titles via disqualification yet again when they take on the Legion of Doom. This is a fine match. Uh, LOD go crazy on the nation. On nation. On the on the New Age Outlaws, um, whatever. Four out of ten. Then we have the Warrior Rumble match. You have Mike Tyson in the sky box, and to say that this isn't a predictable Warrior Rumble would be an understatement. Everyone likes to bitch and moan and complain that the 2015 Warrior Rumble match was the most un was was the most predictable Warrior Rumble match when my boy Roman Reigns won the Warrior Rumble match. The most predictable ever. Well, I say, you're a load of shit. 1998, Warrior Rumble was even more predictable. Stone Cold Steve Austin was going to win this, or Cold Stone, as, as Mike Tyson would play, because he can't tell the difference between Cold Stone and Ice Cream Company and Stone Cold, one of the baddest man in the fucking wrestling world. So you have this Warrior Rumble match. And this is a fantastic Rumble match. Even though it's incredibly predictable. Even at this point in time. It's not even in retrospect. It's predictable. Even at this point in time. It was, as going on, a very predictable Rumble match. But it doesn't have to be. Smart Mark, stupid asshole fans are not going to sit on their hands and say, Stone Cold Steve Austin doesn't deserve to win the Warrior Rumble match. Oh, it was so fucking predictable. Oh, it sucked. Boo. You know, back then when people weren't so fucking jaded and weren't so fucking critical of everyone, and when back then while everyone wasn't such a super Smart Mark fan where they could actually sit there and actually enjoy fucking shit for once, 17,000 people in this particular building in San Jose, California. These guys, 17,000 people, they sat there and they enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, and this was great. A fantastic Rumble match. An 8 out of 10. One of the finest Rumble matches you're going to get. Stone Cold Steve Austin pretty much dominates. There's a whole lot of moments that talk about here. Um... 
This is the one and only Rumble match where one person, Mick Foley, shows up many, many, many times due to a loophole. Mick Foley shows up as Mankind, Do Love, and the Cactus Jack. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin being a marked man. The Rock goes 50 he goes 50 minutes in this match. Hell, Bradshaw goes 40 minutes in this match. I don't know who the hell he... I don't know who dick he sucked back in 1998 when he was fucking uh, new blackjack Bradshaw to get 40 minutes in the Rumble match, but he, here he is. Fucking insanity here. Um, so your final four is The Rock, Farouk, um... It's The Rock, Farouk, Steve Austin, Do Love. Good Final Four and a fantastic Rumble match. 8 out of 10. It lasts about 56 minutes. Stone Cold Steve Austin wins his second and back-to-back -back Warrior Rumble match. And ain't nobody back then is going to bitch about this. Fantastic Royal Rumble match. Next up, we have the main event. It's the casket match for the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship. Shawn Michaels... With the Generation X, defeats The Undertaker in a good casket match. This is very good. But it's also rememberable for more. This is the match where Shawn Michaels breaks his back. And he breaks his back very early on. So, Undertaker has him in a military press. Shawn Michaels gets out of it. Undertaker reverses Shawn's next move. Back body drops him over the top rope. And Shawn Michaels' back hits the casket and pretty much breaks his back. And Shawn Michaels' career would be over. And a lot of people, after WrestleMania 14, literally, legitimately thought that Shawn Michaels had to have retired. Nobody thought in 1998 that four and a half years later, Shawn Michaels is going to come back. In the summer of 2002. Not miss a step whatsoever. And become an even better professional wrestler. An even better in-ring performer. An even bigger star in my opinion. You know. He finds Jesus. And he comes back in 2002. It's one of the greatest if not the greatest comeback stories of all time in wrestling history. I love Shawn Michaels comeback. The comeback kid story. Love it. Um, so this is the match where he breaks his back. Kane and The Undertaker. Looks like that they're on good terms here. Looks like whatever brother, brother an animosity is going on. Has finally been, dis uh, been distinguished. Been extinguished rather. However, towards the end of the match. Kane comes out. You have Las Periquas still. You had... All these people attacking The Undertaker. Just like in 1994 where you had like 10 or 15,000 guys attack The Undertaker. And it took that many guys to eliminate The Undertaker put him in the casket. Basically the ending is kind of like that. So you had DX, you had Lost Periquas, you had all these guys being up on The Undertaker. Kane comes out, he cleans house. His pyro does not go off somehow. Um, and then he attacks The Undertaker. Um, so... He wasn't, he was just, he, nah, -uh, nothing's changed. Kane is alive, and Paul Bearer, yes, Kane is going to destroy The Undertaker. Undertaker then gets put inside the casket. Shawn Michaels finally, they shut the door, and Shawn Michaels beats The Undertaker yet again because of Kane. But the, this isn't over, this is far from over. Uh, they then lock the casket. Sean leaves, yet again, the champion, uh, having to be carried by Triple H, who's on crutches. So, tri Triple H is on crutches, and he has to also carry Shawn Michaels. Uh, again, our bloody-ass Shawn Michaels leaves with the title, defeating The Undertaker because of Kane. Kane locks the door, the, the casket door, and he... Puts gasoline on it. And then he sets it on fire. Then after the show closes. They extinguish the fire. They open up the casket. And long behold. The Undertaker is no longer in the casket. 
And little four-year-old me saw all of this. And this is one of the earliest memories I have in professional wrestling. Actually, this is the earliest memories I, I have um, in wrestling history. I vaguely remember seeing this as it was happening. Um, I'm not going to say I was a fan of wrestling, but this is a very, very early moment for me. Probably the earliest moment that I can recall. Um, Kane burns the Undertaker alive, but they open up the casket after the show. He's no longer there. Um, I don't know if it was the very next night on Raw, or maybe it was the week after, but a lightning bolt strikes the casket. Undertaker sits up, and he says, I will walk straight through the fires of hell to face you, Kane. And this is just fucking awesome. Then you have Mike Tyson and Stone Cold in the ring in Raw is War the night after. So, anyways, that's Raw after Royal Rumble. Great shit. This is a fantastic match. 8 out of 10. And overall, this is a good, very good show. And you start to see why 1998 really is one of the greatest years of all time. I would say, actually, it's probably number two or number three greatest years of all time. I would put 2000 and 2002 with the WWF and WWE as one of the greatest years in its company's history. Fantastic show overall. The 1998 Warrior Rumble show gets a 6 out of 10. Good shit you had. The casket match, the Warrior Rumble match. Everything's really fine. And you see why 1998 is such a good damn fucking year. And I'll catch you next time when 1998 year in review continues with WCW's sold out one of the best shows ever. Just like how Backlash 2000 is leaps and bounds better than that year's WrestleMania. Sold out 1998 ends up being a much better show than Star K 1997 end up being. So that's next. And for WWF, it's no way out. There ain't no easy way out. There ain't no shortcut home. See ya. Goodbye.